Okay, well, thank you, Peter, for, for uh, and all of you for, for welcoming me to this uh, this evening. I must admit, when I see that magic number of 100 participants, uh, I think, golly, we've only got about 120 people in our village. So it's, it's like a complete village gathering here this evening. Um, and uh, certainly I've seen more faces on this uh, this uh, a Zoom call tonight than uh, I've seen uh, in quite a long time. So it's lovely to see you all. And, and particularly so uh, when you honour me by asking me to talk about Iceland, uh, which uh, for, for many years was a, a sort of almost what I thought was a home from home. I've got a lot of um, friends out there and I was fortunate enough to uh, guide trips out there for about uh, 10 or more years. Uh, uh, mostly, I have to say that most people like to go along the south coast, uh, but obviously you have been round and through the centre. Um, but you will find, you know, a lot of the uh, pictures are, will be along the south coast. And, and uh, arguably because uh, when you deal with uh, school parties and college parties, they often want to go in sort of March or October rather than the summer. Um, it's it's always difficult to try and find uh, the, the slides that actually give blue sky and, and sunshine uh, rather than blizzards and uh, everything else. Um, but um, so so over 10 years, I've kind of put together an archive and I thought I'd start by giving some of you, although uh, a straw poll of when, when we first gathered uh, around about seven o'clock showed that an awful lot of you had obviously... Uh, ventured across the briny to Iceland. Um, so uh, maybe you don't need quite such an introduction, but for those of you who haven't been, I thought I'd, uh, I I'd go ahead with that one. So um, let's, let's, uh, let's go uh, on this and see how we get on. So this, by the way, is a picture taken of probably uh, the most recent Icelandic eruption, which a lot of people in the UK uh, didn't really hear about because it didn't affect Europe at all. Uh, it went off in 2014. Uh, it was a large fissure eruption and, and it went off in the summer of 2014, right in the centre of Iceland, um, uh, which came out of a volcano called Badrabunga, um, uh, which is, for those of you who know, is over towards uh, Vatnajökull, but I'll, I'll show you this a little bit later. So this was just to to give you the taste really. Um, the one thing I always like about Iceland is that, um, you know, when, when we're on Aaron, particularly studying geology, you know, uh, when, when we're talking about igneous history in Aaron, uh, our youngest igneous history is 60 million years ago. And uh, um, sadly, there was nobody around that we can ask about what, what it was like 60 million years ago here. But the wonderful thing about Iceland is that Although it's it it is twenty million years old, really, uh, um, what we think today, uh, from about eight seventy one, we had it colonised by some of the first settlers. Uh, Ingolf Arnarson from Norway was one of the first settlers, and uh, ever since that time, uh, they they have actually been keeping records, and and so we we do have an insight in what took place when how, what it was like, etc. And that, that's a tremendous uh, asset, you know, when you're trying to work out uh, what happened rather than actually all the, uh, the general dating techniques that we, we have to uh, um, go to today. Now, for those of you who uh, sort of don't know uh, Iceland or so, um, uh, I used to always think, you know, I can be there in about an hour and 50 minutes from Glasgow. And typically we, we fly from uh, Glasgow and, and if, you, if you are flying in from the first time, the last 20 minutes, if you've got decent uh, weather, it is tremendous because I don't know whether you can see my uh, pointer there, but you actually come in around uh, sort of, uh, I think you come in around uh, just past Ingolshofen uh, and the plane flies all the way down the coast and it goes right over the top of uh, Sertse and Heime, uh, and then comes in on the Reykjanes Peninsula, which of course is the site of uh, our current uh, potential eruption here, and lands at Keflavik. Uh, and then about 40 minutes, you actually head down the road 
into Reykjavik and greater Reykjavik area. So um, most people uh, kind, kind of, uh, when they arrive in Iceland, kind of do this bit. Some people only go, sadly, as far as the Black Sand Beach at Derale, or Rainisfera. If you can venture a bit further, it, it's really worth it to go all the way up to Fatna Yokel uh, National Park and the ice lagoon that James Bond uh, featured with the uh, Aston Martin going over the surface at Yokel Salin. Um, and if you can go even further, you know, go right out to the east, up through the, the uh, cold desert to Egelstede and to the largest waterfall uh, in Europe, at Detifoss, uh, Mivatten up here with uh, a crack here uh, and that that to me is is the main bit for geology and this bit but of course uh, you know you can take a shortcut and go right through the center which is brilliant although you need special vehicles or you can drive around highway one all the way around the edge and come through Akakiri and right the way around uh, and back down into Reykjavik it's about 1400 kilometers uh, uh, if you've got a bit more time, you can go out to um, uh, the West Fjords up here uh, or, or um, the uh, site of Jules Verne's story, Journey to the Centre of the Earth. At, uh, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Uh, um, over here anyway, sorry, it will come to me in a second. Uh, so that that's Iceland. Um, as I say, 1,400 miles round. If you were to look at the surface of it, it's uh, um, 100,000 square kilometers on, on the surface. And uh, the largest ice cap, Vatna Yokel, I'm told you can get uh, Greater London in six times, or it's roughly about the size of Yorkshire, or whatever, that's that. And uh, it's, it's over 600 meters thick. Um, so, that just gives you a little bit of such. You, you actually on this map are kind of seeing the main uh, ice caps of Vatna Yokel, Hoff's Yokel, Langer Yokel, Murder's Yokel, and the lovely one that we had in 210, Eyjafjallar Yokel. Um, so you've got those, but there are other ones, smaller ones around. Um, so getting into a little bit of um, sort of more topography we said that the surface of Iceland was about 103 square kilometers um, but actually it's underlain it's like a large iceberg really and it's underlain by a platform that's about three times that size and this is situated in the center of the North Atlantic um, around about 3,000 meters of water all right um, you also know that Iceland is famous for its fishing, and that's because um, it, it's got this area here, which is their continental shelf, which goes out about 200 kilometers. Uh, and of course, that's where some of the warmer water, we have a part of the Gulf Stream that comes up past the south coast of Iceland, the Erminga Current, and that mixes with some of the Arctic water coming down. And in sort of January, February time, in the shallows, you have all the cod coming on shore and so that's the tremendous fishing grounds that of course uh, uh, we were all fighting them for uh, during the cod wars so that's that bit it's also inter interesting that that area also it is uh, at, at the height of the ice age sea level dropped uh, about 150 meters um, so in actual fact this area here um, um, is is where some of the uh, more recent moraines, if you like, going back to the last, last ice age are. So if you ever try to take a, a journey around Iceland, you won't find any Icelandic moraines uh, that are going back to the last, last ice age because they're under all underwater. Um, the current ones that you see, some very big ones, go back to about 1890. So that's just a little bit. bit. Um, the highest part of uh, Iceland is Kvanadal's Nuka, which is nearly about 7,000 feet. Um, and that's the peak, but it's also, not surprisingly, part of a huge uh, volcano, Mount Orifel. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now I've got, I've got about, just to, for those of you who haven't been, or even for those who have been, and uh, like me, tempting you to go back again, um, 
I just got about 20 slides very quickly to, to give you the, uh, the sense of what it's like. Uh, and at one time I, I sort of hailed from Liverpool and then Newcastle. And when, when I first went out into Iceland, into the centre, I thought it was rather like going in some parts of some of the coal, coal industrial areas of the UK because there were black mounds everywhere. Um, the difference was that you had the moss, um, uh, which gave the green, and then the white of the snow. But you had these three different colours, the black of the, the tephra, the volcanic ash of various products, the green of the moss growing over it, and then the white of the snow. And of course, um, if, if you go probably about April onwards, um, then you start to see the glaciers. If you, if you go between now and about April, then so much of it is white generally that you don't really uh, get the idea of the ex extent of the glaciers and you don't also see the lava flow. So it is, it is quite nice to kind of go from about April to end of September. And uh, you possibly do know that they've only got two seasons in Iceland, summer and winter, and uh, summer starts kind of April. Um, so this again just gives you an idea, you know, when you're driving by coach over all this loose tephra, you know, um, I'm sure you know that tephra is um, kind of sedimentary uh, material, if you like, thrown out or propelled out of volcanic vents, uh, and it can be any size from fine volcanic uh, ash or sand size right the way up to volcanic boulders, if you like, or bombs. Um, incidentally here, and we're going to talk about these here, you'll see two particular types of landform here. This is um, a landform which is a fissure eruption, but it's a fissure eruption that actually uh, was confined to ice. So although Iceland, uh, the, the oldest rocks on the surface are about 15 million years of age, for the last 2.5 million or so, Iceland has actually had various bouts of glaciation, about 10 of them. And of course that meant that this normal volcanic eruption that comes out of cracks and fissures in the ground, when, when you get to uh, the ice uh, age, when the magma comes out, it, it can't it can't run uh, like the syrup that it, it should do. It's confined by the, the the glacier on either side or the ice on either side. So it sticks up as sort of jagged and irregular ridges. And they have a lovely name for this called Mobergs. All right. So this is a Moberg. You notice this mountain behind it is a little bit more flat topped. Uh, more like a, your coffee table. And this is what we call a stappy. Uh, and this is where uh, the magma coming out of one of these fissures built up and built up and built up um, to the level of um, the thickness of the ice, which at that time would have been up here. Um, when, it, when it actually got to the surface of the ice um, and it was no longer being quite so violent because uh, really water and ice, as you know, don't mix. They're rather like uh, water and a chip fan or uh, a griddle. Um, when all that, what we call freetic activity ceased, then it just gushed out what we would call a tourist eruption these days. And uh, you just have uh, the, the magma uh, spilling out onto the side of the ice. And then when the ice melts, you leave this, leave this table mountain. So that's a Stappy and that's a Moberg. And both of those are indicative that this, these volcanic formations actually formed during the ice, ice ages. Um, uh, this is a, a view uh, again going in. This is a, a beautiful place called Fjordsmark. Um, often out there, the, uh, if you see a P, it's not a P in Icelandic, but it is pronounced as a TH. So when you see it in the map, it will be Paul's mark, but it is actually Fjord's mark. Uh, and uh, um, essentially, this is a meltwater channel that um, braided stream uh, is coming out of Myrdalsjökull, uh, a big ice cap up there. And Myrdalsjökull um, is the glacier. Jökull is Icelandic for glacier. 
And underneath that is the beautiful volcano of Katla, the very infamous volcano of Katla. And of course, Katla is supposed to have the same plumbing system as the 2010 eruption of Eyjafjallajökull, which would be actually just over here a bit. All right. um, this again, uh, boy, you know, sometimes we talk about British Rail and having leaves on the line and buses not being able to go anywhere. Um, you know, this this was a coach with about 60, 60 people on it, and I was guiding them. And this is going down the Elger Fissure. This is a volcanic crack, uh, one of the biggest eruptions that ever took place in Icelandic history. Uh, and you can see, you know, the size of it. Um, um, it. It's the size of some of our glacial valleys. Um, and this is a beautiful braided river uh, that we're, we're crossing. So fantastic. Um, going down, we said that about 50% of Iceland uh, in terms of relief is higher than 1400 meters or 1200 feet. So it's pretty cold, pretty inaccessible. And there's only 25% of Iceland that, that's actually uh, lower than about 200 meters or 600 feet. And this is this is the ring road. This is Highway One, and uh, this this is a, a set of sea cliffs all the way along. So we're actually driving on a raised beach here, um, and of course a lot a lot of Iceland and the breadbaskets of Iceland are often on these raised beaches. Uh, but Iceland generally, about eighty percent of Iceland can be split up into. Uh, three or four main um, sort of demarcations. On the one hand, as I said, um, right over in the east and in the center, where you're over about um, 400 meters, you're into desert plateau. And this is particularly so around, uh, around the east when you go uh, up towards where the, uh, the main ferry port is, uh, Sadersfjord coming in from Norway and uh, Bergen and also uh, um, uh, Faroe Islands. Uh, and uh, essentially this is huge. Uh, this used to be all gravel roads, but they've been slowly doing them up. But you see, you know, the barren area with sort of May Mobergs and Stapes and lots of volcanic ash, if you like, all over. And uh, they have the ice tires that you drive over, but 52% of the island it is made of that. 12% um, is actually made of ice. And uh, this is a picture taken from that black sand beach, uh, lovely black sand beach of Rainisfera. Looking back, and, and this is uh, 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 Murder's Yokel there, and uh, Eyjafjallar uh, it is over on this side. And so this was the site over in this area of the 2010 eruption. Whereas th this is uh, where Katla is, and uh, that's a little dribble called the, uh, which you'll see in a later slide, the Solheimiokl coming off. That's where President of Iceland often takes dignitaries from all over the world to show the effect of retreat on his glaciers. Uh, this is up that ice cap, just to give you an idea, and uh, down there you can see the sea, if you like, and you can see this beautiful. Uh, um, uh, Valley Glacier coming down. You can see these kind of mobergs, which have then been uh, um, um, eroded by the ice and snow. And so you've got arets and corries and cirques. And actually, later on, we're going to see this. You can see this is like a, this is actually um, a volcanic uh, plug that's come out of the sea. And so we're going to see that from the other. Uh, vantage point down on the coast in a minute. That's called Petersay. All right. Um, so there's that's um, this is going towards um, uh, the Va Vatnajökull. This this is the Vatnajökull National Park, and that's the ice cap up there. And you can see some beautiful uh, um, bits of chunks of rock. Often they've got seismic sensors on them because um, they're um, this this is this is where the mantle plume is is, is positioned in this area, and uh, we have this lovely uh, valley glacier coming down, and that's the ice lagoon. This is 
probably one of the largest uh, glacial tongues or snouts in, in Iceland. It's about nine miles from one side to the other. Um, this is a 600 meter deep, 600 foot deep rather, um, ice lagoon. Uh, this is the breed Mercurial. And uh, you get all of the material brought down um, in conveyor belts fashion from, from the, the tops and dumped into this, which is right next to uh, the sea really and the ring road. Getting closer, this is the uh, Solheim Jokul, and this is where ice meets uh, volcanoes, if you like. Here you'll see the Solheim Jokul, and you'll see these lovely uh, witches' hats, if you like. And uh, essentially, uh, those of you who know a little bit about uh, glaciology will know that um, at the surface of the ice, which could have been up here at one time, um, we would have had little crevasses and uh, little a plumbing system called moulons, which actually take take the uh, the uh, uh, water down, carrying all the sediment, and then because the sediment, the volcanic ash, uh, retains the heat, um, that keeps cores of ice inside of them. But the rest of the ice, which is a bit more pure, melts away. So you get all these little Ku Klux Klan or witches hats all over the place. But the great thing is, of course, you can walk over this relatively easy because um, you've got all this grit on the surface of, of the, uh, the, uh, the glacier. Um, this is what he tries to say, and I don't know how good this image is, but you might see somebody standing there with an aluminium pole there. And then up here is an aluminium pole here and further to the right and carrying on up are aluminium poles. And that was the front of the glacier, uh, and that's the retreat, which is about 100 metres every year. And that's kind of from the snout going back that way, and also down, um, and also in from the sides. So tremendous amount of uh, melting of the ice and glaciers, which, of course, uh, it's quite important, and it, and it could get us back with a bit of positive feedback from the, from the planet, in the fact that the pressure from the uh, ice is actually, in some cases, keeping the, um, the volcanoes at bay. Um, another part, apart from 12% ice caps, you've got 11% lava fields. And this is one of the largest eruptions. In fact, this area is two, two uh, er products of two eruptions. Um, that's a sea cliff, which we're going to see in a minute. To get you an idea of scale, where I'm standing, it takes me uh, an hour at 40, 50 mile an hour to get to that sea cliff. So we're talking about 50 miles, uh, what we're seeing there. And that sea cliff, uh, Mount Loma, Loma, Loma Magnupa, it is at the front of that huge glacier that I just showed you, which is going round um, um, towards um, the, the James Bond Ice Lagoon. And that is 700 metres straight up, really, uh, there. This uh, is the Lackey Lava, uh, which possibly caused uh, the French Revolution. It, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's, it's one of the biggest eruptions in Icelandic history. Um, and uh, as I say, it, it, it comes out both this side of, of uh, the uh, Mount Loma Nupa and the other side. Again, there's another mountain behind us and it comes out the other side again. So huge area, um, all basaltic lava. Um, this is on the Rakiens Peninsula, where, which is it's actually quite close uh, where we are here. Uh, to the potential site of the new uh, volcanic eruption. And uh, here you've got lots of uh, bas basaltic ejecta, if you like, scoria, which is uh, a little bit heavier than pumice, which is the, the core, kind of more acidic or rhyolitic equivalent. Um, great for building uh, material, build loads of roads, and you can see the gravel road here. Um, and you also, if you've watched Top Gear, you'll see them... Uh, uh, I think they did uh, have some of those jeeps that actually went up the side of some of these and then had cages on them, so they toppled down. So you, you, you can uh, 
enjoy the majesty and the sheer process that formed this and you can also have some fun um there's my mount low magnupa all right beautiful sea cliff and uh probably you could drive about half an hour um across this raised beach before you hit the present sea level all right? so it just gives you some idea of, of scale and there we are in in kind of uh nicer times if you like um there's the view of petersa uh which i was uh, talking about a little bit earlier when we viewed it from there and this is really interesting because it, it's it's in a way what some people think is possibly the way in which iceland um started life indeed this this is a raised beach so at one time the sea was all the way in here and this is Derale, and you might just see a volcanic arch there all right and uh, there's often puffins on that one and beyond it is Sertse and Heime. And you possibly al already gathered that if it's got an A on the end, it, in Icelandic, that means island. So Petersse is Peter's Island. Derale, um, I, I think it, it's 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 like um, Portland. Um, and uh, Heime, uh, Sertse, etc. So essentially, we would have had um, a, a submarine volcano rather like uh, Sertse in 1963 that came out of the sea here since the core of the volcano had the more solid rock that that would have been in the center but then you would have had a bit of a tail a bit of a material loose material coming off the side which would have been lava uh, and ash or tephra that would have been eroded away by the prevailing winds and waves and so you're left with the core and that's what you have. You have a chain of volcanoes, which are like these stumps. And these are all former submarine volcanoes. Uh, this, though, area of low ground, which is a raised beach, is also the ar ar archetypal uh, example in, on the planet of what we call a sander. So a sander is, is an outwash plain, generally because up to your left here we've got loads of glaciers and lots of volcanoes underneath them you have melt water and you have glacial uh, volcanic melt water it all comes zooming down in the form of huge lehars but they're much bigger uh that their icelandic equivalent of a lehar is what we call a jokulhal and they have these jokulhals that come down remember jokul is is glacier um, from the glacier and it comes down and you get thousands of tons of sediment dumped in what was the sea so actually Iceland is prograding or building out into the sea um, so it's, it's worthwhile land investment actually if you invest in a bit of sea around here you might have a bit of land in a few years time uh, so a good bit of real estate but but essentially and this area is then the area that's all farmed uh, and uh, utilized and it's that's highway one uh, the main road going along there there's your sander again and you actually see the main road highway one you can see that one of those glaciers i was talking about before uh, this is skaftafell national park and up here is mount uh Kvan Kvanadal's Nuka, which um, this is Mount Oriofel, which is quite nasty in the fact that it, it's got acidic magma, more uh, viscous magma underneath it. And uh, that has produced ignin brights. And uh, the whole area on this coast along here is called Hofti. Uh, and that meant wasteland because in both the 13th and 17th centuries, this volcano blew away all of the settlement in that area and uh, you can get pumice deposits and everything else from around there so this is kind of a little bit more east but we're going to come on to that i just wanted to show you the the sand deltas so there were some pictures to set the scene as we all know iceland sits on top of this giant zip which we call the mid-oceanic ridge and you see there on this map it's got this line going through there but you know the truth 
it, it is not like that at all, really, when you're on the ground and you're starting to look more closely at it. You haven't got uh, just one bit of ridge segment going through there. In fact, you've got several. Um, a geology map would show that um, if you looked at the surface of Iceland, the, the far west and the far east are actually where your oldest rocks are. And that's not surprisingly because really the zip zone is where the, the brown is here. Uh, although you'll notice we've got a zip, if you like, going through there and a zip that's going through there. This is where Keflavik Airport is and that's where the Reykjanes Peninsula that we're talking about, uh, currently worried about here. This is Sertse, this is Heime, and this is kind of Hekla, uh, just, just around here. That's Eyjafjallajökull and that's Kapla. And then over here, we've got Grimsvotn and Badrabunga, all right, all of these volcanoes. So we've got one current zip going that way and another one going that way and possibly um, an embryonic, embryonic one going that way. We've also got an older zip fragment going through here. So we've got quite a few. But essentially, if you go to the centre of Iceland, the oldest rocks are on the outside and you get younger as you're going in towards the centre. Notice up a Pleistocene, this is less than 700,000 years. And really, so from the Playa Pleistocene there at 3.3 million, um, the ice started to hit Iceland about 2.5 million. So really, anything that's 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 really the grey and the brown um, could have been uh, normal, quiet tourist type of eruptions under air, so subaerial, but they could equally be subglacial, um, producing Mobergs and Stapes in 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 this area, going from grey through to brown. So two types of eruption going on there. So essentially. What we now know, looking through historic records, is that we have about one eruption every five years uh, through historical times, based on the fact that uh, man arrived in uh, Iceland about 871. Um, we always talk about the foundation of uh, Christendom in Iceland from about 1000 AD. So really, since about 1000 AD, we've had one eruption every five years. What we seem to find out is the smaller eruptions like Eyjafjallajökull and that seem to go on for about maybe 15 days, 20 days. But the larger eruptions, and they, they can be once every five years, but the larger eruptions such as Elger and Laki um, can go on for six months, even up to six years. Uh, when you're over in the east, and the west, it's a little bit going like to the Isle of Skye or the Isle of Mull, because you've got this beautiful trap like topography where you've got a lava flow because it comes out on land, it pours over, it's like syrup, it just pours over the surface and it forms a, a nice flat, if you like, bedding plane. And then you've got the pyroclastics in between, and then you've got another lava, and more pyroclastics. Of course, on sky, often because of the tilting. These are like cheese wedges going down, but this is a little bit like Mull or the Antrim Plateau, if you like. That's the kind of east and west. Um, and you can see that if you go to Gullfoss, um, beautiful uh, Golden Falls, um, about uh, an hour's drive or so from uh, Reykjavik, you can see the way across the falls uh, where the river, uh, the River Quita, the White River, has actually cut through the lava in the last uh, 10,000 years. So, you know, that lava matches up with that one and that one with that one. And you can see the different layers and often they've got um, volcanic, uh, sorry, they've got glacial tills between, all right? And then of course, if it's a subaerial eruption, you've often got explosion craters, uh, such as uh, Kerith, which is uh, by the Rift Valley itself. Uh, this, this was a, a, a big uh, explosion of, of gas uh, and stuff. And notice, you know, around it, you don't, you don't see a lot of litter uh, of debris. 
So you can imagine the power that actually formed this was so powerful to blow all of this out, out of uh, the view of uh, uh, anything that you can see here. So tremendously powerful. And I apologize, but this, this is the end. There's actually a crater row. So there's about three craters in a row, but this is the one that people often visit. Uh, this is the one uh, many years ago that the singer Bjork um, uh, held a concert in and uh, had all their amphitheater around. Um, so getting back to geology, we've got the, uh, the Reckiens Ridge coming up through here and uh, through the Reckiens Peninsula here. This is the airport. Uh, this, this is kind of where um, uh, Reykjavik is at the moment. And this is what we call the Western Volcanic Zone going up there. And it goes through Langeyokel there. Um, if we go further to the east, we go through an area which has Surtse, then the um, uh, Heime, which went off in 1973. Uh, and we come through, uh, you might, uh, just lost me a uh, mark of it. Uh, you might see Eyjafjallar Jokul there and Murders Jokul there and Hecla's just about here. So we have the Eastern Volcanic Zone going through here. All right. Uh, and then we have possibly another volcanic zone uh, going through here, going through uh, more like Mount Oriofel uh, in this area. And this is kind of where we think the mantle plume is, although it depends on whether you like plumes. It, it, if you're um, uh, like Professor Fulger, Gillian Fulger from Durham, uh, she she kind of explains this. She doesn't like this as a mantle plume. If you go on mantle.org, you'll see that she explains it away as a, uh, the source as a slab graveyard from the Caledonian uh, subduction bits going down there. Um, and over in this, uh, we've got Snaefell's Jokel. I knew it'd come back to me where Jules Verne went down. And, and you've got a, an older volcanic zip over in that area. Um, in between, very importantly, you notice this zone, which is a transform fault. So this is where the crust is going this way about a, a centimeter and this way about a centimeter. The same is going the Eastern volcanic zone going that way about a centimeter, that way about a centimeter. But along this area, along the South coast, we've got the South, South Iceland seismic zone, which is uh, like a transform fault. And so this is just like, um, a bit like San Andreas. And this is where you get the bigger earthquakes up to about seven on the Richter scale. Currently, we're getting magnitude three up to about 5.5 with the volcanicity going on here. But this is where the big ones, uh, vol uh, earthquakes happen along, along this way. We've also got one going along here and we've got the thorn fracture zone going along there. So you notice in this little area, we've got our own little microplate, the Threpper plate. So uh, Iceland not only has got a spread in ridges, constructive plate margins, but it's got um, passive plate margins and a microplate within it. And also depends on your viewpoint, a mantle plume. So lots to, lots to see. When you look at some of the textbooks, the idea is uh, one of the things we should think about is why do we get so much magma underneath Iceland on the basis that the magma plume, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the island itself is on the mid-ocean ridge, but it, that's a chain of mountains and there's not too many mountains that actually crop up out of 3000 meters of water. So there must have been um, perhaps something else occurring many years ago to, to generate that volume of magma sufficient to make uh, a base plate of Iceland, which is about three times the size of what you see manifesting at the surface. Um, and the idea is that around about uh, 15 or 20 million years ago, probably about 20 million years ago, um, the um, ridge segment or the, 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 uh, the actual splitting center actually passed over the more stationary uh, mantle plume. And when those two coincided, 
they think that that was possibly the reason why you got so much more magma than would just be um, generated by coming out of uh, a spreading uh, ridge. You'll notice also that the plate that we're on, although these days it's split in that way and split in that way, both plates were actually um, sort of moving. So it, it, if, if you like, you know, the plate is actually moving that way over the ridge. So in actual fact, as you go to the, the west of Iceland, you, you get, if you like, the older ridges, ridge bits. And it does seem, they call it a, a process called ridge jumping, that every once in a while, the, the actual um, uh, split in Iceland actually jumps slightly more to the east. Hence, we've got the, the one at Snay Fells over, over here. And then we've got the western volcanic zone then the eastern volcanic zone, and then possibly the new embryonic uh, uh, zone there. So that's the idea, as I say, that um, we've got a, a giant plume coming up from deep under Iceland, um, and uh, it impacts at the surface round about where Two of the most eruptive or frequently eruptive volcanoes in Iceland are currently uh, Badrabunga and also Grunsvatn, all right, uh, under Vatnajökull. But obviously we're talking about uh, what's happening over there. And in 210, we were talking about what was happening here. So not over there at the moment. So that was just a, a recap of where we've gone. Um, if you go to that rig sediment, and this was what the BGS very kindly put together, you, you see that um, if you've not been before, um, we, we talk about a zip, but it's anything other than a zip. It's a complicated zip. Essentially, it's a pile of ridges uh, and, and hills, if you like, ridges and furrows. Uh, and this is, this is uh, the big crack that runs through Thingvellia National Park. Which is, which is where um, it is mimicked seven miles away in the east by the crack over here. This is Harafnagia over here, uh, which is uh, one, one of the cracks. Uh, I've forgotten the one on the other side, but it is on the uh, thing there. And uh, this essentially is splitting and a centimeter going that way and a centimeter going that way, or well, that's the idea. Uh, coming back to the distribution of volcanoes with regard to that, um, you can see there, uh, number two is Badrabunga, um, there's kind of Hecla, um, and uh, these are the volcanoes along in this area, uh, which we're currently kind of more concerned about, um, because actually the volcanicity in this area is, is at maximum only about a thousand years old. Um, and these days we think that vol volcanicity can go on uh, from anything from half a million years to about one and a half million years, all right, uh, of age. Uh, that's Sertse and that's Heime there. So this was uh, just a little bit to give you an idea. And, uh, and I think um, some of you have been to Aaron might have might have seen this picture that they put together. This was um, some of the geologists in Iceland, which were just talking about the plumbing system of a typical volcano. And it was to do with one of the biggest eruptions in 1783, which was a crack or fissure eruption, the Lackey eruption. And that was fed by a pipe or a dike, which is currently what's happening at the Reykjanes Peninsula. And that in turn was probably going down to uh, one of many magma reservoirs which at one time would probably go all the way back down to, to the upper mantle. But in some ways coming up, we've had alteration of that magma and sometimes we've got more acidic or granitic melts mixing. Uh, and so we've got different types of magma uh, coming up towards the surface. Indeed, in Iceland, I think there's about 25 different common igneous rocks. Uh, obviously the commonest, it is, is your various varieties of basalt, um, the, the commonest associated with uh, spreading ridges is tholeitic basalt, which is a bit paler and a bit more high temperature. Uh, but that, that's kind of 
what typically we'll see some pictures of this, but you have all these Roman candles that go off at about 300 meters high. Um, uh, and where, where they go off, you then have a mantle, a, a plume of ejecta, which then falls down and forms a cone around them. And if you have one of these Roman candles that goes off for any, any length of time, prolonged time, you then have a bigger cone and you generate a, a central volcano. Of course, some of these, like Grimsbottom, actually have volcanoes that go off under ice. And that's when you generate all these Jochelhalts or uh, uh, glacial lehars. Uh, so it starts off often, uh, as we're finding in Iceland at the moment, with cracks and uh, 34,000 earthquakes uh, last week uh, on the Reykjanes Peninsula. As I say, most of them are a bit smaller than three, but some of them getting up to 5.5 or so. And if the ground really does rip apart, you know, you could get this, and I apologies, there's no scale on this, this is about two metres wide or so. This is um, in, in the main rift valley itself of Thingvellia, and this is a rift that goes down to the water table there. Um, and this, this is quite a few metres wide, probably uh, in this particular instance, about three or four metres wide. Sometimes you can actually, uh, on some of these, you can actually almost hold hands across uh, one of these fissures that's opened up through earthquake action. But then, of course, when those fissures occur and the ground opens up, then you get these big fire fountains, as we did in 2014 from Badrabunga. And uh, as we did in Heime, which um, overnight opened a one and a half kilometre fissure uh, and spurted out fire fountains, you know, um, 2,000 feet high um, and covered the whole place in ejecta and then emanating from that, all of the lava flows. Um, various pictures then, just to show you, if you had an eruption like with the last Iafiakliokal uh, eruption, um, the reason that caused all of the pyro pyroclastic material was obviously because on top of that volcano, uh, there was uh, 600 meters of ice. And this um, volcanic eruption burnt through this 600 meters of ice in about 48 hours. And you get these amazing crevasses open up as, it, as the ice subsides down into the caldera. And then, of course, all of that uh, uh, crevasses and the meltwater uh, then lift the glacier up and pour out as, as all these glacial floods. This was the picture in 63 of Surtse as it as it came out of the Atlantic Ocean and it it was it's probably I think it is uh, one of the newest formed um, islands on the planet and uh, it's uh, a place of nature conservation because uh, essentially we're, they're just monitoring the scientists the colonization of this brand new island. This was AF Yapliokal in 2010, the first eruption in March, before we had this kind of episode uh, later on in April. Um, and uh, this was the scene both before and after the eruption. This uh, is the island of Heime, and this is Helgafell, which was the last eruption on that island, which was, uh, came up about 6,000 years ago. And I remember in 1973, they all thought the volcanoes lasted no more than about 10,000 years and they were dormant. Little did they know that in the summer of 1973, sorry, the winter of 1973, January, um, there was a new uh, mountain, Eldfell, that came out and 2.2 square kilometers of new lava was ejected across the harbor here and the importance of Heime is it's on that continental shelf and it's one of the safer anchorages and it was a hot spot for catching cod. So it was one of the best harbours in Iceland and uh, th this island of 5,000 people, uh, the future was threatened by this volcano 
where the lava um, progressed to block this, uh, this harbour. And essentially, it was an amazing Icelandic geologist who came up with the idea of putting seawater on it and freezing the lava and creating a lava wall that's probably the height of a three-storey uh, house all the way around, protecting the buildings that uh, remained. This, to me, is the typical uh, site. Uh, it's an amazing view uh, in Krafla, which is northeast Iceland. And it just shows that they don't always admit to it. But, of course, trying to harness this volcanic power, the Icelanders have been actually um, developing geothermal energy. And up in the Krafla area in northeast Iceland, they did start to establish a geothermal power plant. And I don't know whether they got it wrong, but for those eight years, we had lots of uh, lava coming out of uh, progressive eruptive phases of all these fissure type eruptions, the Krafla fires. Um, and it's, it's interesting to note that they've started exploiting more and more of the Reykjanes Peninsula. And so maybe that could be part of it. Um, it's it's very difficult. They've got a lot, lot better on their, uh, monitoring their geothermal fields, but maybe uh, they haven't been uh, quite clever enough on this occasion. One's not really sure whether it's just natural. This is um, this was the uh, eruption, the first eruption uh, coming out of Eyjafjallajökull uh, uh, by Fjordsmark um, in 2010. And, you know, it was a beautiful tourist type of eruption with just pyroclastics going up and coming down. <clears throat> and I remember being there when this was going on and the Icelanders were taking our super jeeps up the glaciers and they were going up there. They, they had a coffee table. They took lobsters up with them uh, and they had a barbecue uh, roasting the lobsters against the, the, uh, the lavas coming out of these and you might have seen there's an amazing one with James May uh, trying to take on Dante's Peak if you ever see Top Gear and he was driving along here um, with, with the pyroclastics coming down on him so that was Air Fjallajökull in 2010. Coming back in terms of the Rift Valley uh, you see uh, the tremendous fissure that's opened up uh, and essentially uh, Almanagia, which is uh, the, the fissure, fissure on this side next to the American plate, um, <clears throat> is going this way and, and Harafnagia is going that way. Notice the shape of some of the mountains. Um, this mountain here is a stapy, it's more tabletop, and that was formed under ice. This one is more of a Moberg. It's a fissure eruption that never actually got through to the surface of the ice at that time, and therefore it's very jagged. This one, though, uh, Skeldabrida, is a beautiful shield-like volcano, and that was a subaerial eruption uh, when there was no ice, and that's about 300 meters high there. Uh, so you, you get the idea of the shape of the uh, landforms depending on the process that formed them. So this was subaerial when there was no ice, just gently building up over a long period of time, maybe 50 to 100 years, this beautiful shield-like volcano. Um, this one occurred under ice, but never the eruption never actually broke through the surface, hence it's quite jagged. This one, though, got through to the surface and just poured out at the surface, and then the ice melted away and it left a tabletop mountain. So every mountain, if you like, tells a story, if you like. Um, that's uh, a nice picture of it, if you like, without all of the clutter of the words, and there's Skelda Breeder there. Um, this whole area is lava flow that actually came out of that volcano. And uh, as it came out, it blocked the flow because uh, beyond that, uh, volcano Skaldabrida is the Langerjökull ice cap and the meltwater flows uh, towards the south 
and actually flows through this lava flow. Hence, the beautiful lake that's in this rift is crystal clear. That's why they all go diving in it, because there's no sediment, because it's filtered through the lava there. Um, there's your typical view again, and that's what I was talking about. There's a stappy, there, beautiful um, mountain top, tabletop. And this is just some diagrams showing that as your eruption takes place, um, when the mount, uh, eruption first starts to come out of the uh, through the water, um, the magma, when it reacts with water, tends to form pillow structures. So you get some absolutely brilliant uh, pillar lavas. And then as uh, it progresses, the eruption underneath water or underneath ice, a little bit of water gets into uh, the uh, from the ice and the water gets into the magma and that causes the magma to pulverize and it forms all this very fine tephra um, and it just looks like sandstone but we call it hyaloclastite or hyaloglassy uh, sediment or, um, and essentially that just looks like sandstone but you, you get this it's called pelagonite and then above that, if it does break through to the uh, the surface, you get your normal type of shield type of eruption um, on the top. So that's what a stappy, the cross section of geology through a stappy like that one is. And this would be what you would see in a Moberg. You'd see pillar lavas at the bottom and then all this hyaloclastite at the top. That's why it's so jagged because it's all loose and glassy. And there's your classic pillar lavas with the glassy edges all the way around. And you notice the radial cracks going in. Also along there, we get lots of, uh, which you'll see right where they're talking about Rekianes at the moment, you get all these sulfur taras with beautiful uh, um, areas where they're producing sulfur. This is the sulfur, the old sulfur works at Selton and Krusevik. And uh, um, they used to mine sulfur here uh, um, for gunpowder and stuff. Um, but it's a tremendous place for seeing mud pots and hot springs. And of course, uh, when the melt water goes down through the very porous lava flows and it hits the magma, it comes up as geysers. So you get all these uh, geothermal areas, very hot geothermal areas are typically where the temperatures are anything from 200 to 300 degrees centigrade. Uh, incidentally, you can't use this water directly because there's lots of impurities in them. So they actually, at the geothermal power plants, they run this hot water uh, next to cold water pipes and use heat exchanges. And then it's, when you're in Reykjavik, it, it's the hot water that you get, which well, the cold water that's heated up by these geothermal areas. So these are high temperature geothermal areas. In Reykjavik, we have what's called low temperature geothermal areas, which is the water, the groundwater there is heated up, but but it's it's not so hot that it's got so many mineral salts in it, and therefore you can use it direct to heat up places. And the very first area they used to heat up in the 1930s or so was their primary school. This is the cost of an eruption, although I'm looking at these figures, if you look there, they're small beer compared with the, the latest issues. Um, the Eyjafjallajökull Yoko um, eruption, just a small VE uh, volcanic explosion index 2 on the scale, caused a $130 million a day loss to America through uh, Lots lost of uh, productivity and airlines. Oil dropped for four dollars a barrel. Boy, what it's dropped after COVID. Italy lost four fourteen dollars uh, million dollars a day rather from uh, selling fresh produce. A hundred thousand flights cancelled and eight million passengers unable to fly. That was Eyjafjallajökull, and uh, that was the scene uh, in twenty ten in that area. Slightly bigger, the Lackey eruption, which first got me interested in geology was years ago. Um, 
an eruption that went over for six months, 50% of all the livestock lost, 25% uh, of a 50,000 uh, population, uh, uh, 10,000 people died of famine in Iceland. They think that the cold weather that this created and the heat haze, uh, it give, killed about 26,000 outdoor workers in Lincolnshire um, just through respiratory uh, illness. It, it, it probably caused the uh, French Revolution and it caused the Mississippi to uh, and the Gulf of Mexico to freeze over. And that was um, lucky uh, VE6. Uh, for six months in 1973. Um, coming back to the Reykjanes Peninsula, there's there's Hengil, which is really uh, where a lot of the geothermal power for Iceland is currently coming from, uh, the, the latest one. Um, and you can see all of the boreholes and uh, the hot water coming out of them. Um, further in from there, I, I mentioned a lot about basic uh, basaltic type scenery, the darker coloured rock, but of course we do get uh, more sticky uh, uh, rhyolitic melts. This is a beautiful pitchstone uh, lava flow coming out of uh, Land Manaluga here and all of the beautiful uh, rhyolitic scenery. So you get some amazing colours. Uh, this is more into the highlands, a place called Land Manaluga. But um, Coming back lastly to where we're at, obviously there's sort of uh, two thirds of the population of uh, Iceland located in Reykjavik. And here's this peninsula where we've got the west Western volcanic zone coming through. Um, there's the main thing, Valia Rift, that we've seen the pictures there and that geothermal power plant of Hengil there. Um, I showed you those mud pots, which are in Krusevik. Um, and essentially the volcanicity in age gets younger this way uh, from uh, east to west. So the volcanicity around Hengil is uh, about a thousand years old. We call it the Christianity lava flows down here. Uh, but down here, uh, Reckianes and around here, we're only down to about 800 years. So that's why you hear everybody saying, it was only 800 years since the last eruption. And there's, although it's in Icelandic, there's some of the um, ideas, you know, there's, um, uh, my apologies, we're the other way around. So yeah, these are the 1200, million, uh, 1200 years. So that's 800 years to present. And they're, they're the, uh, the oldest ones there. And this is the area where we think the eruption is gonna take place around here. There's a beautiful mountain like a pyramid called Mount Killer that you see when you're driving along the road to Reykjavik. And it's just behind here uh, that we think there is a dike-like uh, intrusion that's been coming up. And of course, you've got all this magma that's trying to get towards the surface, hasn't quite reached it yet. We reckon it's about 800 meters below the surface. Um, because that's coming up in existing ground, it's obviously causing magma inflation. And you've got these beautiful um, inferometer uh, readings showing ground uplift of about 40 millimeters in this area and magnitude 5.7 uh, magnitude earthquakes. So this is going up, this is going a bit down. Um, and this is where we think the uh, eruption is going to take place uh, if it occurs. And that was today, this morning. Uh, if you don't go on their web, well, go on their website, veda.is, uh, V-E-D-U-R and dot I-S and then go N for English. Uh, you'll get all their reports or go on Reykjavik Grapevine. And you can see, they think there's a, a dike-like intrusion about eight kilometers long. Uh, going down four kilometers and only about a, a meter wide. Some of it solidified, uh, but it could come out at any time. So apologies if I've overstepped the mark, but uh, in time wise, but hopefully um, uh, it's been of interest. <laughs>